So today we're going to be talking about crowdfunding and specifically how you can involve that into your business, how you can use this to get funding, how you can use this to attract potential customers. It's also a really big media event and opportunity and specifically I want to go through how to smash your goal on Kickstarter. So Kickstarter is one of the major crowdfunding websites out there and that's what we're going to be covering today is how to do that. So we're going to be getting into even if you've never even considered crowdfunding, some of the stuff you're going to need to get started there and also if you have heard of Kickstarter or Indiegogo before, um, how you basically can do this without a huge following. A lot of people think you need a really big budget to do crowdfunding. People think you need lots and lots of social media followers or Instagram followers. So I'm going to show you how to do that if you don't have that kind of clout. And also if you don't necessarily have a lot of time to plan, like you don't have six months to prepare for this project. That's really what I want to get into today. Um, so my goal for you is number one, that if you already are familiar with crowdfunding, that you feel ready to launch, or you at least know what you have to do if you wanna have a successful campaign and you wanna actually get the funding, you wanna actually use this as an event in your business. If you already are familiar with it, also you might be a little bit hesitant or uncertain, wanna make sure you feel confident going into the campaign there. And finally, if you stay until the end, um, you guys brave the rain, so. <laughs> If you stay until the end, I'm going to share with you a list that I've curated of free resources and tools that you can use with your campaign. This can basically just help supercharge your campaign. Um, there are a lot of resources that are very either low cost, low budget, or completely free. And they can help you set up this campaign and also get more traffic and these different things. It takes a lot of time to, to curate that, so I hope that you enjoy that. So who am I? Um, I'm Salvador, and basically I got started in this industry in 2012. I was kind of doing this, this mini econ th thesis in college, and there are all these categories on Kickstarter. So there's like theater projects, there's film projects, there's technology gadgets and gizmos, and I had this idea that depending on the category you launch on, the variables that affect success are gonna be different. So if you're a business owner doing a technology gadget or like a new watch or something like that, your social media network might not matter as much as if you're doing like a film project or something like that. So I've been giving talks a lot on this. I also started kickstarterforum.org. We have more than 8,000 members there. I have a YouTube channel um, under my name, Salvador Brigman. We have more than 10,000 subscribers there now. Um, I also have this book. Kickstarter launch formula. If you guys want a copy at the end, I'm giving away some of these for free. I also have the podcast Crowdfunding Demystified, where we've had on more than 200 entrepreneurs, people that are right now raising money, and they share with you how they did it. They just kind of get into their strategy, and I ask them some of those like uncomfortable questions, like how did you actually get funding, how did you get traffic, and kind of break it down like a no-nonsense way. So this has been my passion, is to kind of codify this for you. And um, just kind of like as, as a snippet, one of the, also the reasons I got really interested in like my Latino background and culture is that recently, well, to uh, so go back even further, I was a adopted from El Salvador when I was one year old and I grew up in a predominantly white community and recently I've been getting more in touch with Latino culture and actually last year I went back to the country El Salvador and I tried to find my birth mother there and I only had a photograph of her holding me as like an infant kid and I passed that all around in the town where I was born and that led to a really interesting story and I was actually able to find her and I can tell you a little bit more maybe at the end of the talk if you want but I also wrote this book on it called Little Thumb of America that goes into that. So this is kind of like my, it's kind of emotional for me. I don't want to talk you know, too much about it now because um, I really want to cover this. But at the end, if you're interested, I can tell you a bit more about that journey, that, that like, incredible story, man. 
So my vision for you is that you claim freedom, that you learn how to launch one of these campaigns. I'm gonna show you real world entrepreneurial success stories, people like you that are doing this and to get backers. These are the things that you're going to need if you're interested in taking advantage of crowdsourcing. First thing you're gonna need is a pitch video. This is the first thing that people see when they come to a campaign. The pitch is, what am I gonna use this money for? What is this product that I've created? What is this business? And what are you gonna get out of it? Um, you're also gonna have the campaign page that kind of goes more in depth into that, goes into, okay, I've been working on this for the last year, I have these patents, or I have this, this incredibly cool functionality. These are the specs behind the product. You then have what's different from crowdfunding and other things, you have compelling rewards. So a lot of people think like, you do a crowdfunding campaign and people are just kind of giving money to you and like you can just take that money and like fly the cash to the Bahamas or something. You know, but it doesn't work that way. It's not a donation. When people give money to a campaign on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, what they're actually saying is I want to pre-order this product. So if they're giving 100 bucks, they get access to really cool rewards like maybe the product, maybe something ancillary that you know uh, complements the product in some way, maybe an experience if it's a film related project. So all these rewards that people get access to and that's why crowdfunding has really taken off. Off. And there's also a fundraising goal and a fundraising duration. So how long are you going to be running this campaign? 30 days, 60 days, 45 days. And also what is your goal, the target amount that you're going to try to raise money for? So this is all going to make a little bit more sense in a second because I want to go a little bit more in depth into some of these elements. So the first one. This is an example of a uh, entrepreneurial team that raised money that came on my podcast. They raised over 900,000 Canadian dollars for the Coast Sand Travel Dress. So this is a dress if you're a wanderlust traveler and you don't like having to change all the time and you want a dress that's multifunctional, this is the dress for you. So they created a really great pitch video and we're gonna talk a little bit about that in a second. And they also were able to track more than 6,000 customers or backers using this particular video. And to pay attention to sort of this, it, it, the whole idea behind a pitch, you think of a commercial, like a commercial is very impersonal. The difference between a commercial and crowdfunding is that with crowdfunding, you're not only talking about like the benefits of the dress, like it's travel friendly, um, it's really lightweight, it's an adjustable length, it's easy to pack. You also get into the lifestyle of the person who actually wants to own that product. So maybe riding on a motorbike in the Philippines and you're wearing the dress, or you're looking over a majestic sunset, you know, the mountains and it's beautiful and you're wearing the dress. You're using the video to not only hammer on the functionality and the benefits, but you're also putting it in context of the person who actually is gonna buy the product. And that's when people see the video, it's really interesting on Facebook, like, wow, that's me. Like, I wanna buy or I wanna own this thing. And that's what they did really well with their project. And we talked a lot about that on the podcast episode. Along with the video, one of the things you're going to need is the campaign page. So if you imagine a Kickstarter page, you have the video up front, the pitch video, and then you have the campaign text, which goes further in depth into what it is you're offering. This is kind of like a sales page, if you want to think of it that way. The campaign page, to give you an example, one of the people that I interviewed for my podcast is Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls. Now, if you've ever been in Barnes & Noble, you might see them. They come on my show way before they were like super famous and popular. Now I can't like get in contact with them. But they, they ended up raising over $600,000 for this children's book. And basically what this children's book is, is it showcases female business owners and female heroines because a lot of the times with children's stories, they're all guys that are like saving the, the damsel in distress. With this, they kind of flip the script and they put the emphasis on female heroines. They were able to attract more than 13,000 backers. They got on a slew of radio publications. I interviewed them when they were probably at like 100K with their campaign. Uh, and then they, they really just, they took off and it was insane. What they did incredibly well is they used image heavy design in their campaign text. So a lot of people don't really read nowadays. You know, I think it's really a rarity. If you're going and just scrolling through Facebook, you're not really reading very much. You're looking at video and images and the same thing holds true with a crowdfunding campaign. So they're using, they're showing visual images of the product or what it's going to look like, that prototype. They're talking about the funds and the timeline and it looks really cool. It's like, okay, this is the goal is 40K and this is the amount that's gonna go into that goal. It's a very visual and experience that kind of gets people's imaginations going a little bit. And of course, they also have what's called copywriting, like in fancy marketing terms, which is kind of just the words basically on the page that are used to evoke these images to make people imagine what it was like when they were a child, you know, and, and the, the children's stories that they read. It wouldn't be great to introduce their kids maybe to heroines rather than heroes with the book. So they use the copywriting for that. Um, that's also something that I help with, with with different campaigns that are out there. 
Another hallmark of crowdfunding is, we talked about there's a pitch video, the first thing you need. You need a campaign text, the writing that goes into that. You then also need the rewards. And talking a bit about the rewards, these are the things that people are going to claim when they support the project. So this is an example of another person who came on my show. Um, she did the Do Anything jacket, at leisure meets sleek design. So this is an individual female entrepreneur who wants to put out a new fashion line. So she used Kickstarter as a way to do that and attract more than 28,000 in funding and you know over a hundred backers and she came on the show and she was telling me all about how it's not just about selling the functionality of the jacket but also demonstrating that in some way so she, yeah she gets into talking about how it's butterly soft and supple feel durable quality easy to clean you know vegan leather but she also has really great images of showing you putting your passport in this you can imagine going on an airplane you know and going to your next destination and wearing this um, so pockets like a you know an amazing thing I think for a lot of female fashion because there just aren't enough pockets for some reason with girls fashion she also did other great stuff you know, we talk about selling a product on Kickstarter, you also package it in some way. So you have complimentary things like she has added value. So the future is female tank top. She sold that as a $29 reward. So you get the core reward maybe, which is this, this new jacket that she made. Then you can also get a tank top. If you want to for 19 bucks, you can also get the future is female pocketbook. Cause they're like these really marble pocket sized notebooks. Um, and it's in rose gold. It looks beautiful. So you're getting this whole package when you support her and it's also supporting female business. And this is kind of how she sold people into her ecosystem of you know wanting to become one of her initial customers because remember the product wasn't really made you know she had the prototype she'd been working really hard on it but all the funding was used for that initial production run of the product which I think is just really cool so what makes it work you know why is this different why is it that like crowdfunding is any different than selling on Shopify or Amazon or these different things so I've been studying this a lot and I think it comes down to number one the fundraising goal because every successful campaign I see, not only do they hit their goal, but they also exceed it. And when you're going towards a fundraising goal, there's like all this excitement that's happening because everyone's on this journey, you hit the goal, everyone's like celebrating, everyone's in the comments talking, and you get even more traction. You know, media publications start to write about you, more people share you on social media. The fundraising goal is a big reason why it works. In addition, the duration creates a tremendous amount of urgency because this is only gonna be available for the next 30 days. It's only gonna happen if they're able to actually, you know, make this happen in 30 days. The way that Kickstarter works, if you don't hit your fundraising goal, let's just say you hit, you set a $10,000 goal, if you don't actually hit that goal, you can't keep the funds that you've raised. So it's almost like, I'm gonna support this and if it doesn't happen, nothing's gonna happen. Like the credit cards are not gonna be charged. It only goes forward if you hit or exceed the fundraising goal. That's really unique to crowdfunding. What I kinda wanna focus on now is how you do this. So the elements of the campaign being the video, the campaign text, the rewards, the fundraising goal, the duration, the, every single campaign has that in common. And I think there's kind of a misnomer out there, like lots of campaigns are successful, which is true, but on average, 30% of campaigns on Kickstarter are successful. And even in different categories, 20% in the gaming category. So a lot of people are doing this. A lot of people are putting out quality pages, but not everyone is getting attraction, you know, attention, traffic, these different things. So what I want to share with you is kind of what I've discovered with that. And we can get to questions a little bit uh, towards the end here. So this is kind of, I've been trucking away for the last six years trying to figure this out. And um, it's taken me a long time to piece this together, but this is what I discovered the hard way. This goes, this is literally the step-by-step -step process that goes behind every successful crowdfunding campaign. And I will show you and prove to you over the next few slides why this works. So you just gotta, if you're interested, you just gotta copy this and like implement it, recommend you take notes. Um, it, it's, this is not being shared you know, anywhere else. So, these are what I call crowdfunding secrets because it's taking me so long to figure these out. And it's not like someone just writes about them. You actually have to interview people. You have to understand what's happening behind the scenes of a campaign and what really goes into the traffic and funding. So first one is, how do you get instantly funded if you don't have a big social media following? Every single great campaign out there, I see hitting their goal within the first couple of days. And they're getting tons and tons of pledges within the first day. So that was one of the questions I had. was like, how do you get instant funding so quickly? You know, how do you announce like people are just 
you know, wanting this thing and picking it up. So that's the first secret I'm going to share with you. Second secret is a simple trick that you can use to get strangers to support your Kickstarter campaign. I don't know about you, but I think when we announce something, you know, our friends and our family are always going to back it. We're always going to buy the product. But how do you actually get strangers to be interested in buying this? You know, how do you get them actually excited and wanting to get in on this? And the third secret I'm going to share is a foolproof way to avoid the Kickstarter slump of death. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what that is and why this is so important, but this is kind of where, in the middle of the campaign, how do you maintain curiosity and momentum in these different things? I also I had another one I want to share, but I didn't realize I'd have less time to talk, so we can't go to the, the fourth secret there, unfortunately. Um, we'll instead take some time for questions, you know. Um, so the first one is, how do you get funded instantly if you do not have a big social following? You don't have a lot of Facebook friends, you don't have a lot of Instagram friends, you don't have any friends maybe, like me. <laughs> how do you do this? Because you work so much, you know. Uh, this isn't working. Like, what I've seen is that with a lot of the students and the people that I've coached, they took the time to build up an Instagram following of like 5,000 people, 10,000 people. Um, they have a Facebook fan page of 20,000 people, and they announce their campaign, and it's silent. It's crickets. No one is backing it, no one is buying it, and it's, it's really frustrating, and they don't understand why. It's almost like the crowd doesn't care about what it is they're doing, and it's one of the most frustrating things, particularly if you spent money doing that, and you spend time. So I wanna share with you why that actually happens and how to kind of counteract that. What I've discovered is that social media is incredible. I mean, it's incredibly advent of the new age, and you can share content, you can get attention, you can share stories, but it's horrible as a sales channel. It's not a way that you're gonna get someone to transact with you. You can warm people up, maybe, but it's not the way that you're going to actually get backers or pledges with a crowdfunding campaign. So if you're thinking, I'm gonna get all these social media followers, then I'm gonna launch my campaign on Kickstarter, you're wrong, that's actually not the best way to go about it. Instead, what you wanna do is, you want to build an email list, and here's why. When you're building an email list, the people that are on that list are interested in what it is that you're launching. They've given you their name and email address, and from everything I found, if you have 1,000 people on an email list versus 1,000 social media followers, the conversion rate is gonna be phenomenally higher on that email list. People are just more interested. They're, they're on the email list, they can then click it, they can go and learn more about it, they can watch the video, they can back it. You're gonna see much higher percentages of people on your email list buying your products or supporting your crowdfunding campaign than you will on social media. And that's why you might have 10,000 Instagram followers and you only have a very small percentage that end up turning into customers or that end up turning into backers of your campaign. A pretty traditional way to do this is you know, people might run ads, do a landing page, build an email list. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second here. So the formula for instant funding to get funding, attention, and traffic within the first couple days of the campaign it's number one, build up an email list of people who have a buying intent. All the time people are like, hey Sal, I built an email list. Like, it was supposed to be really good. You told me this was great. But they did a giveaway. And the problem with that is the people on the email list matter. The quality of the email list matters. You have to build an email list of people who have a buying intent. And what that means is basically the people are opting into that email list because they want to find out where they're going to buy this product. Not because they want something free, not because like they just saw it and it kind of looked interesting and they don't really know what it is you're doing. They see the product, they say, that looks awesome, I wanna find out where to buy it. That's when you have an email list that converts and that's when you get instant funding and instant traffic and attention to your product. Number two, you do a pre-launch. Pretty much most of the money in the first couple of days is in the pre-launch phase of your campaign. That's warming up your friends, your followers, your fans, um, you know, your family to what it is you're doing. You're telling them what is this Kickstarter thing. Maybe you didn't even know that crowdfunding was a thing until you came to this panel. You're telling them a little bit about that. Um, you're talking a bit about you know, uh, what do they have to do to actually make a donation or a pledge. What are they going to get out of it? Why are you so passionate about this? You're warming them up so it's not something you just announce and people are like, oh, Sal is doing that thing. That's good for him. Like they don't know, you have to explain and hold their hand a little bit. And also, you gotta build value and urgency. So a lot of building value is actually selling and talking about the various features and functionality of the product. Building value is extremely important, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and also creating the urgency that they take action now, rather than waiting until you know, the campaign is over. So this is something that I found everyone to be doing. 
You know, and it works for all the different categories that I've been studying over the years. So this works for technology products. It works if you're trying to launch something like a book. You're trying to raise money for a game or a tabletop or something technology related or even a fashion item. You've seen the one example um, that I had there. It works for every single category and it's really the formula to get people interested in your project in the first couple of days there. So here's an example. Uh, of someone who came on my show who was able to get instant funding on Kickstarter. So this is their actual analytics from Kickstarter using KickTrack, which is a software here. They surpassed their goal within the first day. They were able to raise just under $50,000 and they kept progressing and they ended up raising $100,000 for Lord of the Chords, which is a card theory game. So I asked them, so what are you doing right, man? Like, well, how did you get funding so quickly? And like, well, we just built up an email list. Like we did it, we had like 4,000 people on the list. We announced it and lo and behold, we got funded. This is an example of a campaign that did that and it worked and um, you know, now they're, they're doing what they love. They're producing the, the card game here. Another example, this is actually one of the students that is enrolled in my coaching program and course. They produced uh, a WoFun bar board game, Bring History Into Your Home. So if you're a nerd like me or you're a geek, you basically, you can have miniatures that you play with a board game. So you can like, reenact like the Civil War. It's like really geeky stuff. Um, or like reenact battles like the Revolutionary War. What they did was, number one, they built up a community. You see this quote here. More than 1,800 war gamers joined our community and the feedback is extraordinary for us. Almost 900 people subscribed um, to their email list until today to our landing page. Another 800 people are following us on Instagram. They did the pre-launch that we talked about. They built up the email list, they built up a community beforehand. On their first day, they raised $12,000. That's more than 100% of their goal. They ended up raising $38,000 for their project and their products. Another example of a student that I helped out is Hoppy. So this is kind of a product where if you uh, drink beer, you might be interested in this. It's kind of like a Keurig, but for beer. So it's a microbrewery that sits in your kitchen. You push a button and you can brew beer. It's kind of cool. Um, so he, what he did was he basically said, okay, I know I'm going to be launching this kind of new novel product. I got to warn people up ahead of time. He did the pre-launch. He built the email list. He was able to raise $270,000 on his first day. And this is not like virtual money. Like this is actual orders on his first day. He ended up doing 382 over 700% of his goal. He gave me a really great testimonial there. And he also went more in depth into what the, what the actual experience was like. He said, we went live on Sunday at 7 p.m. and achieved an amazing start. This is an email from him to me. We surpassed our goal in 15 minutes, surpassed three times in 30 minutes, um, you know, five times our goal in the first hour, and over 275,000 in the first day. We're now at 298,000 our second day. Um, this is all to your amazing help. And what he did was he did the pre-launch and he built the email list and that led to the funding within that first time. So we kind of knocked out the first one, which is if you're interested in getting not just, you know, funding, but also buyers for your product, you got to build an email list and sort of shift your focus from just doing social media to transitioning those people onto some kind of list of qualified buyers. The second is, how do you get people that you don't know to support your campaign or to buy your product of some kind? Because I think that's, that's what everyone wants, obviously. The way I think of this is kind of like a tertiary structure, um, really nerdy term. You basically have your promises, your benefits, and your proof. Now, I'll show you a few examples of this. The promise is, what are you going to do for other people? What does this product do that nothing else does? Um, if essentially, what is, how is this going to change someone's life? What is the before and after, before the product you know, exists, then it comes into their life, and this is the after effect. What are the, what's the big promise? What are the benefits? What's the functionality? You know, how, what are people going to get as a result of owning this product? And finally, the proof. The first two are emotional. You use your video, you use storytelling to sell the promises and the benefits, and you have great imagery and such. The last one is logical, because we're not just gonna make an emotional decision, because we say, oh no, this is an emotional decision, I should wait, I'm not gonna do this. The proof comes where you back up what it is that you're saying in the first two. So I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate that in a little bit, but the proof is as simply as showing that this thing works, or showing that the promises are going to hold up. 
a simple way to kind of get past this whole stranger component. If someone comes to your campaign, they see zero dollars pledged or no funding, no backers, they're gonna be like, well, this kind of looks like a weird project or this kind of looks a little scammy. Eh, maybe I'll check it out later. Versus if they come to a campaign that already has a bit of funding, you know, people are already checking it out, they're more likely to watch the video, at least sample it. You can think of it like your own personal life. You're walking down the street, you know, with your significant other, you're with your friend, and you're like, hey, I kind of want to eat something at a restaurant. You go to one restaurant and you look in the window and like no one is there. It's like it's dinner time, but like no one's there. It just looks like really empty and really drab, and you're like, eh, let's move on. You go and check out another restaurant, there are tons of people there. It's hustling, it's bustling, people are smiling, they're laughing, it's like a 20-minute wait. You're like, okay. Okay, the food here must be really good. You make conclusions when there's social proof with your project. And all that means is that other people are interested in what it is you're doing and you demonstrate that in some way. When you show social proof, strangers are gonna say, huh, this could actually be interesting. I'm gonna take a second to watch this versus this is probably a scam or like this doesn't look legit or he's not really that serious. Social proof is what makes people pay attention to you that are strangers. The other thing that's so important and crucial is your story behind this product, and here's why. When I first thought about storytelling, I thought it kind of sounded like BS, honestly. Like it sounds like something that people that write novels or like you know these different things might be interested in, but how does it have a commercial appeal? Well, here's why. If you think about the last time that you paid attention to something for the span of two hours voluntarily, I try and think of that, and I'm like, I haven't really done that at all, I think, in my life. But then I think about every single time I go into a movie theater, and when I go into a movie theater, I'm sitting in a dark room, like there's nothing else going on, I'm not checking my phone, and I'm watching this screen and it has completely my attention. And I'm actually feeling, I know it's fake, like I know the actors aren't real, I know what's happening on screen is not real, like there are sets and designs and stuff, but I'm actually feeling real emotions. You know, I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling angry or I'm feeling scared, you know, I'm laughing. Story is incredible because what it does is it focuses people's attention and it also makes them feel emotions towards your product and you. And that's how you can sort of slip your way into a stranger who doesn't care, they're just scrolling down their Facebook feed. With a story, you can actually get them to care. And that is so difficult and so important. So the story is kind of the vehicle, if you will, for the marketing that makes them then go and check out your product and then eventually make a buying decision. And they'll say stuff to you like, wow, I feel like I know you, or I feel like you made this product for me with a Kosan dress. I feel like I, I like that's me riding the motorbike. The story is how people connect and it's kind of what glues it together. Here's a simple example. Um, one of the clients that I've worked with is called Hupnos. They invented a self-learning sleep mask to stop snoring. I actually did the copywriting for their project. It says it analyzes and gently corrects you or your partner's snoring patterns and you can wake up feeling refreshed. This product has the big promise of use this, it's gonna eliminate your snoring. Very simple. It goes a little bit more into that saying it will gently correct it, you'll wake up feeling refreshed. That's the big promise. They get into some of the features and the benefits, like it's ergonomic, it syncs up with your smartphone, and you can track your snoring, it's these different things. And then we all back it up with actually like the, the research and the scientific research behind that. And that's what causes people who don't know these individuals to actually support this campaign. So you can get a bit more into the stats. That's actually the real stats there of the funding that they got throughout their project. So this was created by Curtis Ray, here he is holding the Hupnos, and um, it's, that's what it looks like, the, the sleep mask. So he ended up raising over $100,000 for the sleep mask and more than $14,000 in his first week. The way they were able to do that was promise, benefits, and then logical justification, and a really great story as to why it is he did this, which is that he was waking up his wife all the time and she was really mad, you know, happy wife, happy life. So he wanted to invent something that would help his snoring. Um, and he also, we contacted Indiegogo and they said, it appears your conversion rate is almost double what we see for successful campaigns. You might get a lot of traffic, but if you can't convert it into buyers or backers, you're not gonna have a lot of success with either just online business or with crowdfunding. So we did that using that, that sort of tertiary structure. Um, I also wanna take some time to answer some questions is, a foolproof way to avoid the Kickstarter slump of death. And I think this is actually gonna have a lot of practical application even beyond crowdfunding. So the Kickstarter slump of death, like it sounds like a I, weird term I made up, but <laughs> it's basically loss of momentum. You do a product launch, it's hard to keep people interested after the first week or after the first couple of days. 
you're basically, you're not having a lot of people buy this anymore or they're just kind of trickling in the door. It feels like the thing is failing. You start to panic. You start to be like, is this thing actually going to work? Is this, is this, maybe it was just great in the beginning. You're unsure how to revitalize it, uh, revitalize it. And this is what, kind of when you make a lot of bad decisions in life. <laughs> you know, you maybe invest in marketing or promotion that doesn't work out. Or you believe what people are telling you. Like, the, oh yeah, we can, you know, fund your campaign for millions of dollars. Just give us like a thousand bucks or something. A lot of bad decisions happen here because of this panic state. So I kind of want to show you what to do if your campaign gets there. This is the launch sequence to blow past it. When I've been talking with different crowdfunders, one of the things that I noticed is that in the middle of the campaign, while there isn't that same element of urgency, I started to see that when campaigns got on media publications, they started to do tremendously better on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. And at first I didn't understand why. You start to break it down. First of all, there's a reason why people advertise on publications. It's because it's a niche audience. You know, all these people are basically interested in gears or electronics or fashion or apparel. When you get a media hit in one of those publications, you basically are, it's like a stage and everyone now that's interested in those types of things like fashion or apparel or gadgets, you now have the microphone and they're all listening to you. And you also are certified, if you will, by that media publication. If you've been in the New York Times, the people that read the New York Times are gonna think you're more legit than if you haven't. So basically they're more willing to watch your video or listen to what the journalist is saying. So you get exposure to new audiences, you get instant credibility, and you also get relevant traffic. This is a really interesting phenomenon I think. Um, so we started to, I started to do more coaching around this over the years. Um, and one of the great examples of a campaigner that did really well with this was the Steam Clip campaign. So this is a five-in-one multi-tool for travel pros. This is Randy Blevins. He's holding it up here. And his first day, we followed the, the track that I talked about. He did $6,000, a little bit over that. He ended up raising more than $24,000. But what you don't see is in the middle of the campaign, there was a lot of lagging and there was a lot of loss of momentum. So we planned for this. So what do you ended up starting to do was reach out to journalists. He says here, I appreciate all of your help. Um, it was also great and an important time. The, the important thing here is what he did to combat the Kickstarter slump of death or that middle period, that loss of momentum. So he says, after I hit the big launch button, I updated settings, initiated emails, posted on social media and tested the site. Then I grabbed my bag of Steam Clips and headed to WREG TV for a live segment about Steam Clip. So what he did was he ended up pitching this on TV. He got a bunch of exposure and media attention and this helped him get through that middle campaign period. And that's him in the station there um, holding his Steam Clip. And he, he, you know, it's awesome. I think it's incredible. So media attention is one great way to sort of break through this huge barrier and to actually maintain momentum. The other is social media. You know, talk about social media not being so great in the beginning of a project. It's incredible in the, the middle of the campaign because now you do have that social proof. You have people who have backed the project, who have bought in, who have supported you. Social media then can be used to tell stories, to celebrate milestones, to say, wow, we just made it to you know, $25,000 in funding. That's incredible. If you haven't yet, go and check out some of our rewards. You can use social media as a distribution mechanism in the middle of the project and you can sort of celebrate and share. And if you want to, you can do an affiliate program where like if some of your backers want to share this on their Facebook page, they can do that and they can get like 10% cash back or something like that. Or you can even get a free product of some kind. So you can use social media to your advantage in the middle project, uh, middle part of this campaign. And also of course, paid promotion plays a huge deal. In the last two years, I've seen a huge uptick in paid promotion with these different projects, particularly when it comes to Facebook ads, but also when it comes to paid media. People using Facebook ads, once they've validated the idea that there are buyers, there are people, there are strangers out there, you can use paid media to actually drive traffic and drive customers. And um, it's kind of like a sure bet because you already, you already know that the product works and it has, um, it has legs, if you will. This is an example of a female entrepreneur. So this project actually blew her away. Like I was talking with her and she's so surprised how much traction it got. Um, and also a female entrepreneur, I think it's awesome. So she ended up attracting more than 28,000 backers on Kickstarter. She came on my show, my podcast. She's actually very like introverted, which kind of surprised me because she's like doing, she's killing it here. Um, she ended up raising over, I think it was 500,000, 800,000, sorry, on Kickstarter, um, more than 28,000 backers. You can see the trajectory of her pledges. It wasn't like she got a bunch of funding in the beginning and then it's, it stagnated. She continued to get funding throughout the entire project. So I asked her what led to this and she said, 
Well, basically, I got into a bunch of media publications. You can see all the ones that she got into, TechCrunch, you know, Gear Patrol, Product Hunt. She got the word out there about her product, which is this you know, foldable um, thing for your laptop that kind of helps it stand up. And she also even got YouTubers to talk about her project, and it led to an upward surge with her campaign. So this is, this is really important, um, and just one example. Uh, another example of you know, someone doing some, some great work when it comes to media attention is Shirley Tan, also a female entrepreneur. She invented the Posture Keeper, uh, which is kind of helps with lumbar support, also helps you have really bad lower back pain, like I do from sitting all day. Um, she ended up raising $65,000. She also went through my course and my program. Um, she got over $8,000 on the first day using the first secret that we talked about, and she ended up doing more than 600% of her goal. Talking about her um, testimony here, I'm a big fan of Sal's. I actually purchased the PR and smashed your Kickstarter goal course, have a much clearer understanding. I'm working on the assets now to get ready to reach out to the journalist. Launching is both scary and exciting at the same time. The journalists and the media and the social media can be used in tandem in order to get through this middle period. So with the emails and with the, this beginning period, that's kind of how you can have an upward surge with your campaign and how she really, I think, just knocked it out of the park with her project. So I don't have time here. For, for the fourth one, because um, I wanted to also leave like a little bit of time for questions. But if you're interested also after questions, I have a way, if you want to, you can work with me. Um, so I guess I can stop now, because I know I went through a lot of material very quickly. You might be feeling like this guy. Um, do you have any questions for me? Or if not, I can get into the next segment. Yes? Um, the difference, I, I see you mentioned that kick, um, kick started, because uh, there's GoFundMe as well. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> is it that you work for kick? Or you I don't. Other, because really small, small business, because those are the ones I represent. Yeah. Uh, by the way, my name is Reverend Carmen Hernandez, and I'm the president and founder of the first ever New York City LGBTQS gay and awesome. lesbian straight Great. chamber of commerce. And what I really represent is the really small guys that yeah. nobody, you know, I was just in an expo because we're partnered with a few expos in New York City. We were just in Jacob Javit. Mm -hmm. And the thing is small business, but reality is a medium and larger business. It's not really the small guys. So is this good for a small like, business like kind of? Started, it doesn't yeah. work for me if I'm a starter. Yeah. They're trying to use the little bit you have. Go for me has been a good tool. Yeah. And another thing I wanted to bring you maybe helps you out that when you have your inner circle, because mm -hmm. I got almost 5,000. Yeah. And, 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 and. My space, yeah. I have over 5,000, 10,000. Great, 000. awesome. So the thing is that once you're, you're in a circle, you got the poor people same as you, they're not gonna, you have to go beyond. Yeah. I think what is it we have to get So how do you get, outside. how do you level up? Yeah, yeah and that, that's, so. That's the thing that we want to yeah, yeah. help us out how to go outside. Yeah. So that's the, what you see a lot of artists, they don't make it in New York, they make yeah. it in UK. Yeah, yeah. So first question being on GoFundMe. So what I find is actually GoFundMe is not really that great for business because if someone's going to be making a donation to the business, you, you can obviously give them a reward of some kind, like maybe they get a free service or a consultation. But usually if someone's giving money, I think it's more in line that they're going to be an investor in the business in some way. You know, it's not really charity and business doesn't really go together in my experience. But the great thing about Kickstarter is, you know, when you are pledging money to a campaign, you then actually get to claim these different rewards. You're getting something back from it. I haven't seen too many successful GoFundMe business campaigns. Now it comes to smaller creators, I have countless stories of people who have nothing, you know, and then launch a campaign and they discover this entire audience. All they have is a prototype. And they're able to use crowdfunding to actually unlock that, that huge audience. Um, so I think it really determines, it depends on the type of business, you know, if it's a service business or a product, how it can fit in there. And then um, when it comes to getting larger and larger you know, circles, you know, what we talked about with Social Proof, the more you can get people liking the product and getting testimonials and showing this thing actually works, the more other people are going to be interested in wanting those promises that you're making there. Who yeah. overlooks the funding? What's that? Who overlooks the funding? Do you mean, so like the, the, the oversight kind of. Um, so when it comes to Indiegogo, it's a bit more of an open crowdfunding platform. 
We've seen some scams also there with Indiegogo. But um, with Kickstarter, they have this sort of now guideline where you have to go and you have to meet all these different requirements. So, like they have different prohibited items, like you can't do energy drinks, and, like all these other different items, and um, you have to then be approved to be launching on the platform. I have had some people who you know tried to you know do a project and for whatever reason it didn't work out. But a lot of backers also are understanding of that that they're they're supporting innovation basically, and this isn't a fully made product yet. And a lot of backers, oddly, is weird. Like Amazon, you ship and you get it in two days. Most of these projects, you're getting the product in two months from now when you when you support the product, which is very different from what you might think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess you're giving classes for people that want to learn how to do this. So what I do. Have a yeah. So I have I do my books. Um, I also have online training. Um, I do one-on-one -on -one consultations. Then I also help in terms of putting together the actual campaign. So like if you don't know how to do the social media, you don't know how to put together the campaign page, and you're like, can I just hand this over to someone who knows what they're doing? Then I would also do that for different campaigners. Yeah. So it kind of depends on the stage you're in, you know, because I think it's important to learn also about crowdfunding, which is one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about it. I have a lot of free videos out there on YouTube and podcasts people can listen to, because I think you do need to learn about the process. But once you, you know that, then I think it's really important you got to take action. Because, I mean, ideas, you, know, you can have a great idea, and then a year goes by and you don't take action on it. So any other questions? Yeah. It's probably like a five to one ratio. So like Kickstarter is probably four to five times more popular than Indiegogo, which is its biggest competitor. Still very popular. Um, aside from those, you then start to get into d different types of crowdfunding, like maybe using Kiva or maybe using equity crowdfunding um, or like maybe donation based. But uh, like I said, it isn't so great for business. So it's kind of like Kickstarter is the most popular. Indiegogo is usually great for technology products, like the one sleep mask I talked about. That was a really great fit for Indiegogo. And um, so it kind of depends on what your product is. I'm in sleep diagnostics. Oh, cool. Yeah, there are a lot of competitors too, yeah. right? So the cool thing I think about crowdfunding is that you can actually go past a lot of these competitors. It's a really early adopter marketplace. Like you could never get that in like a huge retail outlet and try to. It takes so long to convince all these people to shelve this in CVS. Mm -hmm. Versus you can go to the crowd, you can get the funding, you can then maybe take that validation and raise another round of capital, or you could just produce it, you know, in house, and you can do that for your business. So it really kind of depends there. And do, how do you do? You charge like a, a fee up front, or do you do a percentage of whatever um, whatever the funding is? Usually, I'm going to charge a fee up front, and then it depends on the type of product and the demand that I could think for the product. I might do a percentage if I'm doing something like Facebook ads to drive traffic to it and to get sales for it. Um, so it kind of depends there on the person.